Good morning. My name is Matt Wilson. I'm a reporter with AIM Media. I'm here today with Victor Pettis, who's running as a Democrat for State Board of Education District 2. How are you today, Victor? Doing good, man. Thank you so much for the invite. Thank you for the opportunity uh, that uh, to do this interview, to get my, myself out to the public. Those who don't know me will get to know a little bit about me. Glad to have you. Mr. Pettis is running against L.J. Francis, who's running as a Republican. Um, this is part of a series of conversations being put on in partnership between AIM Media, Futuro RGV, the League of Women Voters, and the McAllen Citizens League. Interviews will be posted on social media by The Monitor and Futuro RGV. Mr. Pettis, why don't we start off and you just tell me a little bit about yourself and why you're running. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I'm running because I, I got uh, encouraged by a couple of our state officials. They've known me for over 20 years. I've served as a city council member. I've served as a school board member. I've served also as a municipal judge. And then over 20 years in education, um, I started as a teacher coach. Um, worked myself up the ladder, became an assistant principal, principal, and uh, left the district, the, the school setting about uh, about six years ago as a district uh, operations, you know, uh, uh, court administrator. So uh, I've gone through the ladder. I know what it is. I work with you know teachers. As being a, as a principal, you get to see what the needs are of our students and teachers and counselors and so forth. So uh, it's been a blessing. I, I think it was uh, something that I really enjoyed and uh, I miss. But uh, there was an opportunity uh, for me, uh, and I went and took it. But I'm not now the president and CEO of the Far Economic Development Corporation. Uh, again, when I was in uh, the in school district, I got some schools recognized, TA recognized, and so uh, I'm I'm very happy to have you know gotten those schools recognized in the district that I work for. You know, the State Board of Education is probably not the most visible entity in the state. Uh, why don't you just tell people about what it is and what it does? Right. So there's a 15 member, uh, State Board of Members in the state of Texas. Uh, my district runs all the way from Idaho County all the way to Horton County. It's 14 counties. So as you can tell, it's a big, big, big uh, district. But uh, the State Board of Education, again, you know, they oversee the graduating requirements, the curriculum, textbooks, uh, the, the, the Texas State uh, Public Fund, and so uh, they get to see, uh, make a lot of decisions for our students and our future of our students. So it's a, it's a very uh, crucial uh, position right now. We need somebody experienced because everything that we're going through right now, it's uh, it's imperative that we select someone that's been in the classroom, somebody that's gone through the through the chains, the commands, and, and experience everything from a teacher all the way to a district administrator. You know, something we've been asking candidates, I think it's a good question, is what the biggest challenge and asset is in the district you're running so for. So in all those counties, what's your biggest asset and what's your biggest challenge that right. you expect to face? Uh, my biggest asset, again, is my experience, my knowledge in education. Um, having gone through, the, you know, again, through the levels and different levels of education. But uh, the asset is that I bring is that uh, we have a lot of good teachers. We have a lot of good students. The issue here is that we need to continue to help them and give them the funding and the materials and supplies that they need for them to to be successful. Uh, I, I got to experience COVID. My wife's been a teacher for 33 years. And again, when COVID kicked in, I remember her working from six in the morning to six, seven o'clock at night, even later. Uh, and I and I saw what teachers would, would you know were going through. Uh, my teachers and my wife's an experienced teacher, but how about those teachers that were new? How about those teachers that, that didn't know how, and they weren't trained, they weren't prepared, because again, all of a sudden after spring break, they were told stay home, we're not coming back. And so uh, I saw my wife, and, and then I could just imagine being a former teacher as well, this is hard to do. This, this is gonna be you know, a challenge for our teachers and our students as well. And so right now, our greatest asset is we have, for example, I talked to Dr. Kim from Region 1 the other day. I think he's now the director there. And uh, Region 1 got some really good you know, results from the start test. And so that tells us that we're doing a great job, but imagine even through COVID, we, we still did well. And so uh, our asset is that. One of the disadvantages and one thing that I see is that we need to continue the funding for our teachers and our students, our counselors. Uh, one thing that's really coming up is you know, men mental health awareness. Uh, that's a big problem. Uh, I was reading in, in the paper, not, not so much here, but upstate, is that there, there's been a lot of you know, uh, 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 kids with you know, issues and some has committed suicide. So to me, that's alarming. That's alarming when you look at this and you hear these things because you know, a child should not be going through anything. And, and we, I think we need to have that kind of service. We need to provide funding for that in our school districts. 
And it's something that I'm looking at. It's very important that, that, uh, that you know, our students and our teachers are, are well taken care of. You know, you're talking about the biggest asset being human capital, I guess, teachers just, and students, but the biggest challenge being funding for them, and I assume pay. How specifically would you work to get those people the funding they need? Right. And again, uh, the Texas Public School Fund, which uh, the, is under the State Board of Education, there's billions of dollars. There's billions of dollars. And, and so we need to get the money out somewhere. We need to help those districts that are going through issues, uh, whatever they are. Uh, I know the at-risk kids, the uh, bubble kids as we call them, are very important because we need to make sure that we are, are there to assist them with them and those smaller districts don't have the fundings. I'm very familiar with the small district and the higher district, of course, the, the, district, the bigger district have more funds than the smaller ones do. So we need to focus and make sure that we are, we're have equity across the board and we afford to give them what they need. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set up, one of my goals is to set up a hotline, a hotline so parents and administrators can call that hotline and call me and communicate with me and let me know what is it that, that we can do for them. Not only just in District 2, but the whole state. Remember, we, we're going to serve over 5 million students in the state of Texas. So to me, it's important that, that we continue to, to fund them. And we'll, fund, we'll find fun ways. Uh, I had a, a, a call with Commissioner Mike Morat. Uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, you know, he, I told him, and he invited me over to Austin, and, and said, you know what, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, let's let's come by and meet and, and, and talk. But I've talked to a couple of other superintendents right now from Brownsville and McAllen, where we're de addressing some of the issues that they're going to be going through. But uh, I do plan to be very well well uh, coordinated and uh, and uh, talk to this uh, superintendent from our valley, from District Two. You know, currently, sticking with funding, currently the state funds districts based on average daily attendance rather than enrollment. I've talked to a couple of districts and the leadership there think that if they switched to just enrollment, they would get more funding and could be several million dollars. Do you think that's a good move? Would you support something like that? Of course, if that's what the districts are saying, and again, this position here is not going to be mine. I'm going to be consulting and advising with several of the superintendents and so forth. But it's important uh, because the ADA, of course, you know, you wait, and if the student, say for example, student came in late, uh, didn't come in by 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, the hour that you're supposed to submit attendance, for whatever reason, and we have a lot of, you know, poverty here in the Valley, we have kids that I can't make it or can't get, you know, miss the bus and you, there you are coming in late. Uh, you need to at least, you know, go by, you know, um, not only attendance, but, you know, the uh, uh, enrollment, yeah. Yeah, I suppose the goal of ADA is actually having students in seats and classrooms. Do you think that would lead to any reduction in accountability or? Well, I think that would be up to the districts, and I think we're doing very well in that. I know there's some districts that have issues with attendance, but I think this is where we could be able to assist them with some funding, assist them with uh, some personnel to get, uh, make sure that that doesn't happen. Sure. Yes. You know, um, long-term growth trends indicate the RGV may look, lots of districts here may be looking at lower enrollment. Um, they're not growing. I know that in Edinburgh, we've seen a lot of growth, and lots are seeing kind of a post-pandemic correction that's hopeful. But in the long term, it looks like they're still going to be shrinking in a little bit. What can the State Board of Education do, and what would you do to help districts facing enrollment challenges? Right. And again, very important, we talked about funding earlier. And we need to fund them. We need to make sure that, you know, we get, if they need additional personnel, if they need materials, they need, you know, whatever they need to make this happen and not for that for not that to happen, then we need to be there for them. Uh, being a former principal, I know, you know, when you deal with attendance, I know that you deal with different issues, but I think the uh, most important thing is that, you know, our students and our teachers get what they need, and then we can work from there and make sure that, you know, every district, of course, is different. The demographics are very different from District 2 to District 1 and 5, and so we need to make sure that we work together as a, as a you know, uh, board members uh, and, and, and try to solve each other's, you know, needs in every, in every district, so. Yeah, you mentioned the STAR test earlier. The STAR test has fallen out of favor. Um, some are even calling for it to be abolished or at least severely changed. Um, would you support some severe changes to it or abolishing it, or do you think it's effective? Uh, so, again, being a former principal, right, uh, when you have a student that can't graduate because he didn't do well, didn't pass the STAR test, um, I, I think a test should not, we should not hold kids accountable with a test. Some are not good test takers. Some, you know, might have an issue with, with you know, and I think kids, when I was there, uh, they were nervous and they could not, you know, take a test. They get nervous. And so to me, it's either we make some major changes or we do away with it. 
because I think no student should be just judged on, on a test. And what I found out, and I might be wrong, but you know, uh, this tests are not made or created by people in Texas. They're created from outside Texas. So I'll, somebody from outside Texas know what we need here in the state of Texas. So uh, you know, it's something that we need to look at very seriously. What other changes would you support? Uh, right now, we need to look at you know, uh, uh, you know, the way that uh, we do uh, the teachers, uh, the, their accountability. Uh, the one is the student teacher ratio per teacher. Right. That's very crucial. I mean, uh, you know, uh, my wife's case, she's had 28, 30 students uh, per teacher, and you expect them to do well with you know. And then some of those kids, remember, you have a mixture of kids that are low performance, and you have some that are. So how do you handle that? How you know? So you really have to be a good teacher to make sure. Uh, that you get all your kids to the level that you want them to be. Sure. You know, something that's been on everybody's mind since the tragedy in Uvalde has been school safety. Mm -hmm. um, there's been lots of talks about how to address it. I'm sure you've watched the news. There's been lots yes. of threats here in the Rio Grande Valley. Right. What do you think the State Board of Education, if you're elected, what would your role be in making schools safer and how would you go about doing it? Right. And so that's that's a good question because that's another one that I had in my list is the school safety. Uh, you know, when I was at the district that I served as a board member, we created the police department. We brought in the police department. It's funny that all these things that are happening, but we kind of saw, we kind of, you know, it's a, it was a big district here in the valley. So you want to make sure that, you know, our kids are protected, our teachers are protected. But most of all is just, it's, a, it's very very sad what happened there and we know what happened some people dropped the ball but that's okay I mean right now we learn from those things we learn from those events and so uh, right now it's very important that we continue to communicate with the school district like I said earlier and talk to the superintendents and see who is it that doesn't have some kind of you know security system in their in the school districts so we can be able to provide and again I'm, I'm, I'm it's a big thing here about funding if we have the kind of money we have billions of dollars we need to address and put the money somewhere where our, you know, our school districts in our in our state of Texas are, are make sure they feel comfortable and they feel safe. Yeah, you know, sounds to me like that could be a lot of money. I mean, making police yeah, yeah. forces in house. Right. I know people have talked about hardening schools, so construction or innovation. Where do you come up with the money? Well, the, uh, so this year you can do a partnership, and I'm very familiar and I like partnerships. And where we have, we got to get the region one, region the regions involved. We got to get the state, we got to get the school district involved, and of course the state board of education and TA. It's got to be a team effort. It's, it can't be just us, or it can't be just the school district. You know, uh, again, it, it's a partnership that you establish with you know maybe a security company now if you can't afford a police department maybe you can do a, you know a, a, a MOU with a, with a security company or something like that but uh, to if not then provide them the security doors that they need with all the uh, elements that go with uh, with that sure you know let's talk charter schools um, would you support or oppose legislation to require charter schools to have an elected board like a public school district? Right. So one thing on charter schools, and I've been asked that question, uh, to me, uh, we got to treat everybody equally. Equality across the board. Uh, yes, you know, uh, I hear charter schools and the public schools are, you know, have an issue with them. Uh, the thing is, when you get in this position, you got to serve all the students in Texas, no matter what schools they attend or, or whether it's charter school, public schools, or any kind of school, private schools. So to me, it's just, I think when the time would come there, we would have to make a decision, not only myself, but as a team as the 15 board members that are in the state, the Board of Education. So that's something that we would look in a case by case. And again, it's, it's something that uh, I wouldn't say no, but I, I would really look at closely at, at that. Do you think by and large right now, charter schools are transparent enough in the state? And do you think that they're being held accountable enough? Well, uh, there's some things I think we need to change, of course. There's some things that we need to look at. Again, I talked about equality. When you talk about equality, that means what's good for, you know, Joey here is good for you know, Larry over here. It's got to be the same thing. It's got to be in the same playing field. Of course, you know, uh, that's something that, that again, uh, that would be case to case. The charter schools that are already in, in, in pace, well, that's okay. But it's a new one that would, because we oversee that. Any charter school that comes and applies, then it's something that we need to make sure that, you know, whether they're already there doing their thing or we need to make a change, that we'll, we would need to do that. So. You mentioned changes. What, what's one you have in mind? 
Well, so some of the changes, like for example, uh, I think one of the things that we talked about one day from uh, some of the individuals was like, does the money follow the student or the money stays in the school district that we're at? And so that's an issue, like I said, it's something that we need to work as a team and see what, what is it? What did the other board members think about? And to me, you know, it's very important that uh, we, we take uh, the, uh, the advice and the, uh, you know, uh, from, from the superintendents and, and the districts that we serve. Yeah, I want to switch gears and go to critical race theory. Critical race theory has been much in the news. What's your stance on it? Yeah, I'm totally against that. Uh, I, uh, I believe that, you know, we need to keep history in history. That's what history is about. I know there's some people that want to do away with some of the uh, history por portions of, the, of the, you know, history and, and do, you know, uh, not put in there that, you know, the blacks were slaves and the Hispanics were shot by the Texas Ranger. I mean, all this is history. That's part of history and it happened. So we can't say, you know what, we don't want to put it in our books anymore because, you know, you know, my child doesn't like it at all or doesn't feel good or, you know, I think it's something that we need to continue and keep it. So I'm totally against that. Sure. Yeah. You know, what role do you think the State Board of Education would have in regards to library books? I know library books in the same vein, getting pulled from libraries. Yeah. Right. What and so, think? well, I think we should, again, our libraries right now is another one that we need to talk about because I was the principal. Uh, our libraries did not have the funding or the books that were needed for their appropriate, you know, age level or the appropriate grade level, right? And so it's something that I think we need to have our libraries with, you know, whatever they need, think that school district needs, that school needs, because every, 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 uh, for example, elementary, right? Certain books, middle school, certain books, and high school, certain books. So uh, it's very important that we fund them and we help them, and whether it's with, through TA and ourselves, that we need to work together. Sounds like you're pushing a lot of, I guess, communication with districts on a really low level. Um, and I know you mentioned the hotline. How else would you work with them? Uh, well, one thing is I, I've been asked, you know, you, you, hopefully, you know, you win and, and you're going to be really busy. And I tell them, you know, my thing is, so I already sent an invite to the rest of the 14 other board members to come visit our district. I sent that out a couple of months ago, but I know some, several of them are on, you know, uh, well, um, on the political mode right now, in the election mode. So, uh, but uh, one thing is, I already reaching out to them. I've already reached out to some superintendents, and I believe very strongly in communication. Like I said earlier, it's not about me. It's not about I'm going to reach out to them, and they're the expert. They're the ones going to be telling me what is it that you want me to be doing, especially in my district, and, and sharing with the rest of the state. Sure. Yeah. Victor, that was my last question. If you have anything else you want to tell the voters, we've got a few minutes. Sure. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for giving the opportunity uh, to be in this interview. Um, believe me, uh, when I started this campaign back, uh, back in December, I thought about it, but uh, I had a lot of support from my state legislators. We had uh, the, some representatives that encouraged me because they know me and what I've done when I've been in education, um, not only that, but, you know, uh, they know that I'm, I'm truly going to do what's best for our students. And I'm not just talking this too, I'm talking for the whole state. I, I, like I said already, I reached out already some, to the other 14 board members and see they wanted to you know, get together and, and visit each other. It's important, it's very key. To me, communication is very important. To me, our students and our teachers, we didn't talk about pay, but there's something that I think I'll be advocating along with TA, along with the, you know, uh, and let them know because our teachers are underpaid. And right now, it's very important, especially what they're going through right now. And we expect them and we hold them accountable, but we need to also help them out. We need to let them know that they're important to us. And they're the ones that create attorneys, doctors. Well, you know, it's because of them. So again, all I can say is, you know, um, I expect your vote. Hopefully I can, I can uh, you know, have your vote uh, for Victor Perez State Board of Education District 2. And uh, I can promise you I will not let you down, folks. I, I know what we need to do at this level. And so uh, thank you, Matt, for, for the opportunity. <coughs> Wonderful. Again, folks, this conversation is part of a series of talks that will be posted on the Monitor and Futuro RGV social media. Thank you. Thank you.